Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar about organic control of field bindweed in the Pacific Northwest. I'm your host, Alice Formiga, and before we begin, I just wanted to let you know that you can find all of our past webinars and many articles on organic farming and research on our website at eOrganic.org and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. This talk will last about 45 to 50 minutes, and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions. A handout of the slides of this presentation is also available. And if you weren't able to make it to the live presentation, you can find the link at eorganic.org slash node slash 35047. So today I'm very pleased to welcome Marcelo Moretti and Jessica Green of Oregon State University, who will report on what they have learned about managing field bindweed organically, thanks to funding from a USDA NIFA ORG grant. You will hear about some of the different ways they have experimented with managing this perennial weed and what they've learned about Taita luctuosa or field bindweed moth. So now I'm going to hand the screen control over to our first presenter, Marcelo Moretti. Good morning. This is Marcelo Moretti with Horticulture Department at OSU. And today is my pleasure to talk about organic controlling field bindweed in the Pacific Northwest. It's a project that, as you can see, has many collaborators and we've been doing the work since 2017. And there will be basically two distinct sections on this presentation. First one that we'll be covering is more the hands-on uh, evaluation of how to manage bindweed in organic blueberries specifically. And the second uh, portion where uh, Jessica will lead is a more focus on the biocontrol. So about the bindweed control. Just a quick introduction on how, how we grow high bush blueberry here in Oregon and Pacific Northwest. Basically the standard practice is to have these synthetic mulches, which is often called weed mat, right at the base of the plants about covering about three feet each side with the holes at the planting, as you can see here. I think you can see my cursor. As you can see here at the base of the plant, there is a little opening there where you will place your plant. This is, done mainly for, for weed control. It's much, much cheaper than hand weeding or, or, or organic herbicides. And that's the work was done by Dr. Bernadine Strick over the years. And there are also implications for plant nutrition and, and, and also yield with an increase from eight to 20%. Despite that, the use of the extensive use of this plastic mulch, we still have weedscapes. And those are mostly the perennial weeds, specifically field bindweed, as you can see on the picture to your right. The openings that you have at planting or from the side of the mulch will allow this bindweed to grow and climb into the plant. And that will, will, will have impacts on not only on competition with, with sunlight or even moisture with the plant, but also affecting uh, mechanical harvest or even manual harvest. It's just, if you let it be, it's just that much more difficult to, to, to manage the crop. So what are the options that we currently have to manage bindweed in that system? Well, cultivation is very, very limited, regardless of the plastic, because of shallow roots in blueberries. We, we don't really have anything that would effectively, effectively remove bindweed without damaging the crop. Flaming, which although effective for weed control, is definitely not compatible because of the plastic. And we finally lay, uh, basically uh, rely on, on hand weeding. And hand weeding could be either manually at the base, uh, not manually, always manually, at the base of the plant, or sometimes hand weeding on the shoulders of that plastic. So when we started this project, we were looking for other methods that would be currently available in the market that would fit on that system. Assuming that you're using the plastic, assuming that you're, you're having this, this type of production system. And also looking into a cost effect option because hand weeding is effective, it's just too expensive. So we look into three uh, possibilities and I, I will dive into them a little bit in a second. The first one is saturated steam, which is pretty much like hot water. It's a commercial unit manufactured in Australia 
so by weed techniques and now they have a representation here in California. Uh, the second one is a brush weeder. There are several manufacturers and these are developed for grapes, as you can see a little picture here at the bottom. And we also look into organic herbicides, mostly uh, capric and carpelic acid. There are some other ones that were tested that were not OMRI approved and I'll point it out as we get to that point. Since this is a new tool, I want to spend some time explaining what, what I'm talking about when I say saturated steam. So the saturated steam, the whole magic happens right here where you can see on this unit, we have a pump bringing the water from your water tank. And here is my fuel uh, reservoir. And this specific unit runs on two fuel types. It's the gasoline for the, for the pump and diesel for the burner. The burner is using about two gallons of diesel an hour, and the water pump is bringing in about 160 gallons an hour, and that's with the gasoline uh, propelling the pump about half a gallon. We can set the boiler at different temperatures. I'm not going to talk about the research I've done, but it's pretty clear that you need to be at 250 Fahrenheit in order to have effective wood control. Anytime you drop that temperature to 225 or less, you basically barely see much impact on the plants. At the nozzle temperature, of course, this is the boiler, which is this unit here, very similar to the uh, water heater you probably have in your garage. At the nozzle, we, we measure temperatures fluctuating tremendously depending on mostly on the air temperature because it's not quite accurate the way we were doing it. We we're using just a thermometer. And uh, I got about 190 Celsius by the time this the water is coming out here. So the saturated steam is mostly hot water with a little bit of steam. And the reason for that is, as you can see in this picture, steam is very difficult to trap. So the more steam you have, although it's much warmer or hotter, it's basically being lost and that energy is being lost to the environment. And my target in this case is down below. And this is an example of what to expect after a steaming at 250 Fahrenheit uh, at about a mile an hour. In this unit, it's a continuous flow. So once you turn it on, it takes about two or three minutes to heat it up. And then you're basically continuously driving because you're, you're pumping 160 gallon an hour. Here's a picture, a uh, video actually. I'll see if it works. It wasn't behaving as expected just now of uh, one of our tests and of course it didn't do well again so I'll stop a little bit sooner so just an idea on what we were talking about about applying steam on this objective is basically applying steam to grab the edge of the plastic and in this case that unit was 20 inches wide the second tool that we use is the brush weeder so the brush weeder is mounted on a three-point hitch, as you can see here in the back of the tractor, and it has a shaft on the side with these uh, little uh, plastic fingers. This unit is spinning about 1100 RPM. You can control the flow of the tractor, assuming you have a tractor with full control and go a bit faster than that, but 1100 RPM, we got satisfactory uh, results. And these are smooth uh, cords or, or, or plastic fingers. This whole thing is propelled by your hydraulic system and it requires about six and a half to eight gallons per minute. That will put you at a 40 horsepower, at least a way around it. If you have a smaller tractor would be to use a, a hydraulic pump in there where your PTO is driving a, a oil reservoir and that thing is, is generating the hydraulic flow to, to move the, the implement. But in this case, we're using a larger tractor about 75 horsepower, so we did not need that. And the way this thing is working is by moving fast, it will be cutting weeds at the surface. And depending on how long you stay in a given place, you can even uh, uh, remove the top layer of the soil and cut the weeds a little bit below the soil level. Not much, I'm talking about a few, a fraction of an inch on that top, but enough to generate dust if you stay for too long. And we were applying these, these, this brush weed right at the edge of the mulch, the plastic mulch. And we also test the herbicides. So Supress was the trade name of capric plus caprylic acid herbicide. This is OMRI approved. 
Uh, right now, I'm aware of one more trade name for, for that compound, which is called Home Plate, also Omri approved. We were working with Axe, which is Omri approved for farmstead use only, the meaning that you should not be using where you're growing your plants, unless the bypass there is that if you have some insects and you're killing weeds and insects, and then there is that gray area of the label that would allow you to do so. And on the first uh, objective, we're basically comparing these uh, four tools here, applied at the edge of the plastic, which is where most of the weeds are coming. And on a second objective, we're just trying to replace hand weeding at the base of the plant. And in that case, the steam was applied with a handheld. We did not have this brush weeder. And we used the herbicides either broadcasting, or spraying, or with a sponge wiper. So I'll talk first about objective one. Uh, jumping on a lot of information, just to give you the, the, what boils down to, for you to have effective control of the weeds, you need to be applying about 730 gallons of saturated steam per acre. Since we're only treating about a third of the field, this is more like 240. And then for that unit, that's half a mile an hour, assuming you're applying on both sides. The brush, you can operate much faster. Uh, even two miles an hour, I got some good results. But for, for the sake of consistency, we were using it a half a mile. And then we look at this two herbicides, the Omri approved Supress at the highest label, a uh, highest rate that the label allows in a pretty high uh, spray volume. And because this is a concentration base, the higher the spray volume you use, the more herbicide you're using, and therefore more effective, perhaps and definitely more expensive. And X is the other one that's not quite OMRI approved, but we, we were, were having hopes at that time that the label would change. And the, and the rate here is at 13% and against the highest rate. The way we, we went about to do this testing is uh, five by five factorial. So is all this five treatment follow up by all five combinations. So I end up with 25 different treatments. If that sounds confusing, it's because it is. <laughs> And I will not show every 25. I'll simplify it just, just to get to the meat of it. What kind of weeds we were looking at? We tried in the spring, uh, winter, spring time or summer. And we're looking at soft broom, annual bluegrass, willow herb, and annual tissue in early in the season as we move to the drier time of the year here in Oregon. A lot of times we don't have as much rain in the summer, so we're moving to weeds that are much more drought to tolerant, like prostrate knotweed, sharpshoot fluvelin, and field bindweed. Uh, and that's for the large area field. And I'll be talking about the assessments after this second application. So I've done uh, two applications by the time you see the data. The second field was the one uh, that we were looking at replacing uh, hand weeding at the base of the plant. In that case, I have two uh, distinct studies. One just looking at the efficacy and that's targeting bindweed. And the second one is looking at the crop safety in an area where we didn't have the weed, but we were growing the plants the best we could and just seeing if the herbicide or the steam treatment would affect growth. So now objectives one, objective one, eight weeks after the treatment, that's what the WAT stands for, weeks after treatment. And what I'm showing here is my estimates of control ranging from zero to no control to 100 to a bare ground for the studies done in the spring versus the studies done in the summer. There was an interaction there. And because I'm having all possible combinations here, I combine my non-treated uh, on the second time with whatever was done before. This is why it's not zero here. And I have these different colors coded for the saturated steam, red for the brush, green for the ax herbicide, ammonium nanoate, and suppress is the caprylic acid and non-treated. It's very clear to see that in springtime efficacy was much less than summertime. You just look at the average height of the bars here versus there. Main reason for that we believe is because a constant flush of new weeds germinating. There's a lot more moisture at that time and these 
any of these treatments only have this contact effect. So the weeds that are emerging at the time you, you, you make your treatment will be affected, but anything that happens right after that uh, doesn't, doesn't work. As we move into summer, you can see we're ranging from 90 to at least 60%, maybe 50 here, even with the organic herbicides. What's also clear here that in both situations, the steam and the brush weeder outperform, or at least were as good as the organic herbicides. Here, they were clearly better. Now I'm showing a similar layout as before with the treatments, spring and summer, but now I'm showing you the biomass. We collected weed biomass in, in, in smaller plots, dry it, and I'm reporting grams per square meter here. You can see that the taller the bar, the less control or less reduction in biomass we had. And now we're flipping over. Non-treated was much higher than the other ones. And then in some cases, the organic herbicide did not really affect uh, with biomass. And in this situation, the steam, definitely the brush reader here and the steam were outperforming the other treatments. As you move in the summer, again, we reduce a lot of the biomass. We never eliminate it completely, but we reduce it a lot. There were some interactions. Uh, it's just too confusing to show in here, but I can tell you if you have a good and effective treatment early on, uh, anything that you do later on will be much better. And the second interaction that we notice is that the brush weeder is much less affected by the weed size. So if you have bigger weeds, it will still work fairly well compared to the steam that it starts to be impacted by biomass. It's just that more biomass for you to heat up. There's just not enough uh, water to, to get the work done. How about costs? Since, since the efficacy wasn't quite separating everything as clear as, as I wanted. So we, we've done a, a cost analysis. This is not a profitability analysis. I'm just uh, comparing the input of materials. And for the steamer, that unit retails for about $15,000. We made some assumptions on how many acres you would treat in a year, uh, how long it would last, and we got to $43. Okay, I can definitely say it's below $50 to treat an acre out of that half a mile an hour. The brush meter, it's a much cheaper unit, about 5,000, maybe 10,000, depending on what all the bells and whistles you buy with it. Uh, it was $32 an hour, assuming you're operating in a half a mile but we are certain you could go much faster than that and that, that cost would, would be driving driven down drastically. The important part here is the organic herbicides. Even if you drop the, the volume, remember I told you it's a concentration base, so if you drop from 50, from 80 gallons to 50, you're using less herbicide. They are very expensive because of the amount you're using uh, on, on the area, so 13% out of 80 gallons, it's a lot of product. And that would basically cost you about 170 to 252 with uh, the prices that I got out of the internet for this chemical. If you switch to Suppress, slightly cheaper, mostly because the concentration is lower and efficacy is comparable. So it's a cheaper option, but it's still uh, 120 to $187. And we didn't do hand weeding, but just comparing the numbers I got from uh, uh, from one of the cost analysis, we would say if you estimate six hours an acre, that would come about $64. So STEAM looks promising here, but there were limitations that I would like you to be aware of. Uh, the first thing is the, we're just affecting above ground biomass. So when you have enough moisture in the ground, like in the spring, and the weeds are coming back, even perennial weeds, you're really not affecting in the long term. You're just basically uh, eliminating what's present at the time, but it will resume growth the same day or the day after. The second biggest problem we had is water consumption. 230 gallons per acre is borderline irrigation almost. So it, it was difficult if you think about the size of an enterprise, just to have a person bringing in that, that volume of water, it, it, it adds on the cost. So the cost I told you before was just to run the machine, not assuming I would have a second person just to bring in water to keep it running. And then it talks about the operation capacity and weight. Yes, I could have a bigger tank. In that case, I was using a 100 gallon tank that would allow me to operate for about an hour, a bit less than that. But 
if you go for a bigger tank, you're having more weight and then you're probably having a bigger tractor to operate that it would affect your cost. And not only that, you could be even compacting the soil as you're hauling a lot of water around. The biggest limitation we notice is equipment maintenance. We did some testing with collaborators where they operated for, for a whole week. And we noticed that the equipment wasn't quite ready to, to, to deal with that environment. We had cracks on the water tank. We had electrical problems. We had to replace the boiler. It's just dust and moisture do not combine well with that implement, but that's the reality of farm. When we moved to the brush weeder, that was much more robust uh, uh, equipment. The biggest problem we have is dust. So we try to do some work just before harvest and, and, and then the grower just basically ask us to, to stop it because the amount of dust we're generating in summer would be um, not viable with the plant. And it could have other impacts, assuming that dust would promote some things like mite. The second problem we had is a long-term impact on the weed mat. Weed mat is a big investment, so you want to have that longevity uh, there to, to, to really amortize the cost. But the brush reader was at least being abrasive to the, to the plastic. If you manage to apply it in a way that you're not touching it, perhaps you could alleviate the problem. But anytime we have a small opening on the plastic, it would just make it bigger. So if you assume that you're doing it multiple times in a season over the years, I'm, I'm certain we would reduce uh, the longevity of that plastic and that would affect the cost. This is economically assuming it will last about 10 years. If it doesn't, then it becomes a, a problem. The second limitation we had is if you're not using the plastic, you would have sawdust and you can definitely not use this brush reader over sawdust because it would just spread the, the sawdust everywhere. Uh, I forgot to talk about the herbicides. They were not quite effective. Uh, and that's why I didn't even spend much time on that. You could have different results in places where you have more sunlight, like California. Organic herbicides in that situation are working much better than here uh, in, in Oregon. So now switching over to results of objective two, which is that spot treatment. Here I'm showing my efficacy. So I have, again, my treatments on the bottom, non-treated, hand weeding as a comparison, the steam, uh, the organic herbicide suppress, apply as a broadcast or as a wiper, a sponge wiper. Uh, and then we switch, we had a different herbicide here, which was new at the time, eugenol, uh, so that's uh, weeds layer, not approved by OMRI. And later we learned that it had contaminations with other compounds, but just for the sake of it, you're seeing that with a wiper application it was uh, much more effective than a broadcast. Then we had also the ammonium nanoid, which is X broadcast and with wiper. The point of this slide is to show that steam was performing just as well, if not better than hand weeding. And that was definitely much easier to do. And we are not seeing a complete control here because we're again seeing regrowth of bindweed, both in hand weeding on this or in the steam. The second slide, oh, this is a picture of what to expect on this team. So when I was applying the uh, saturated steam with the hand weeding, we were actually going after all these blueberries, uh, all this bindweed growing the blueberries and, uh, and at times even exposing the lower shoots. And this is what you could expect from the bindweed. If you manage to kill the base, the whole shoot will, will dissipate. So using the same mentality, really exposing these young shoots, as I showed before, to steam, we start to see, to compare what's the impact of that steam on the growth. And I had two varieties here, Duke varieties in the blue color and Elliott variety in the red color. And what I'm showing here is the growth of this new shoot that we selected in year one. And compared to the size of the shoot, the caliper in this case, on year two, after multiple applications, there were like two applications per, per year over two years. So this is how much a non-treated would grow, a little bit more growth on the Elliott, more vigorous plant. As you move to this team, done at this speed, you would apply so 730, equivalent to 730 gallons per acre, twice as much steam here, 
no difference, a statistical difference, four times as much steam. This is the time you start to see injury in those shoots because you're hitting that cambium and then you're affecting the growth of the shoots. We went after the shoots just because they're much more uh, susceptible to the steam compared to a, a well-developed uh, trunk with bark. The herbicide, again, as you increase the rate, you start to see impact on growth. And any time you go below zero here is because we, we kill shoots, so we went to a smaller shoot after treatment than it was initially. And this is the other herbicide here, uh, ammonia weight, used with a wiper. Again, we start killing shoots. Just to show you a little picture here, this is the type of damage you would expect by applying steam at the base. This is a few weeks after the treatment. You can see browning on the leaves, but the top of the shoot is intact and continues to grow. And we did not lose any of those shoots. They got smaller at this rate, four times as much, but we didn't kill anything. Using the ammonia nanoweight with a wiper, even though it's a contact herbicide, it managed to get into, into the, the thin bark of the shoots and eventually kill some of those. We lost quite a few of those. This is the way we tagged, so we were measuring the same same shoot over and over. In eugenol, which is uh, weeds layer, we're seeing injury across all the plant. You see a lot of chlorosis, yellowing, narrow leaves. And now we know that there is a stop save order in California, Oregon, Washington for that product. So now trying to sum up everything, I think the saturated steam was the, the novel technology in there. And the question is, is saturated steam a viable alternative for weed control in blueberries? So the crop safety is pretty promising. Even applying high rates at that at the base, we do not damage the, the crop. It's fairly comparable with the mulches, either sawdust or the plastic. And it gives you effective weed control compared with what we have currently in in organic system. The economics was also promising lower cost control than hand weeding, less labor, but that's not accounting the really cost to run it over multiple seasons because we don't know what kind of maintenance we would have. The biggest limitations are on the technology. The operational capacity for that unit is not compatible with commercial production. Really high maintenance, I didn't disclose of the maintenance costs we had, but this is this unit was developed to be working mostly stationary. If you start operating around the field, this is not going to go well, as we learn. The parts availability are, are difficult because it's kind of a special equipment. And you, it's not something you can just go to your local uh, parts shop and, and buy. And the high water use, I think, is one of the biggest problems we had. It's just too many moving parts in order to make this thing work. So the steam work, it really kills weeds, but the equipment needs improvement. So I would say not yet, it's not a viable alternative. It needs refinement, mostly on the engineering part, which is, I would say, an easier part to, to, to develop. To address some of these problems with amount of water use, uh, I'm now starting a new project in organic blueberries where we're looking to electric weed control. This is again thermal weed control, but in, rather than heating a media like water and applying hot water to kill the weeds, we are applying high voltage electricity to the plants and heating the plant from the inside. The nice part of it is that electricity will move down to the roots and have a root activity, unlike the steam. And the only consumable here is the fuel from the tractor because the tractor is the one propelling the generator and there is no water movement in that. So this is just about to start, but Here's what I've been doing in hazelnuts, for instance. This is our ryegrass. This is right after we apply it, and this is about two weeks later. We, we see a lot of dead grasses. And with that, I believe we are transitioning to Jessica, and I'll stay uh, online to answer any questions we may have towards the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a um, great presentation by Marcelo. I'm here to talk about um, a little bit more, another objective of our grant which um, was using the biocontrols for field blind weeds. So my name is Jessica Green. I'm a senior research assistant here at Oregon State. Um, and just to, I know we all know what field blind weed is, but I just wanted to point out that it's, um, you know, that this is the actual weed that we're talking about. When we use common names, it can be confusing. Uh, so this is a picture. It's got this <clears throat> arrowhead shaped leaves and funnel flowers. 
Convolvula sarvensis, it's, it's one of, there's actually 18 genera in Convolvulaceae. So um, you'll hear people, and even in our project, people said, oh, I've got field bindweed. When we go to look at it, it's not actually that. I'll talk about that in the next slide. As we know, it's a, it's a perennial weed. It's a bane of our existence. Um, and it has this tap root that can go up to seven meters deep, but 70% of the growth is in the lateral roots and rhizomes. So it's spreading across and it's only about um, at most six inches deep. And then, so that's how we think of field bindweed, but I did just wanna mention that there is pretty productive seed um, production as well. And that these seeds are very viable. They can persist in the soil for over 30 years. <clears throat> and another problem with this weed is that it's so tolerant. It's drought tolerant. It's also tolerant to salinity any, any other um, poor soil conditions. So it really does grow everywhere. It's great for job security, but not for growers. Um, so one of the interesting things is when we went out to investigate, as I was saying, people would say, oh, I've got this huge problem. Well, field bindweed is not any prostrate weed growing on the ground. So these are some examples. On the far left is sharp point fluvellin. It does have the arrowhead shaped leaves as well. Um, it's got a hairy stem. It can, it can be confused for field bindweed. And the other one is prostrate knotweed, which doesn't have um, the big, nice flowers, but, but also was confusing. So I think one of the interesting things was that even initially in our outreach um, objectives here, we noticed that, oh, maybe education is an important part just so that people know what we're looking at here. It's also not hedge bindweed. That's a picture in the top right. Hedge bindweed has a much larger flower. Um, the corolla is much larger. The calyx is, is down there below. The leaves are large and arrowhead shaped, but they're, they're much larger. And then it's also not your ornamental morning glories. A lot of people um, think that they can use the biocontrols on that as well. So none of the biocontrols I'm speaking of would be F um, would work on these species. And it's just an important point to note. So when we talk about management of bindweed, we're, we're not talking about control. Um, it's really about reducing the weed to a tolerable point for you. And I think the, if we were to sum up everything that the, the three major components of management would be prevention, um, just preventing it from establishing in the first place, competition and disturbance. So, so bringing field bindweed into an area is can happen. And that's really, once you have it, it's hard to get rid of as many of you probably know. Contaminated compost is one of the biggest sources of bindweed in a new area. So just being sure to, to not move that soil and even your equipment into clean areas. Also um, competition, in regards to competition, you're wanting to, to provide competition for the crop, but not necessarily the weed. So irrigation, fertilizers, all these things can, can uh, um, ultimately affect the weed growth. One of the biggest and best competitors for field bindweed is shade. And so that's why a lot of our cover crop studies work. Um, you can also, you know, physically smother it out by preventing sunlight from reaching it. In blueberries where we were doing most of this work, we don't have that option. And we saw those great pictures from Marcelo where we know that the bindweed is just growing as well, if not better than the crops in some situations. Um, constant vigilance is my keyword here, if you can see that at the bottom of the screen, and, and that's really when anybody talks about, about managing bindweed, it's, that's what it takes. So for those of you that would have the, the um, option for a five-year plan, it's always good to set one of those out. Um, this is a rather obscure paper from the early 90s, but I thought I'd mention it because this works for this grower in the Northern Plains. Um, and it starts with tilling in the bindweed at bloom. So if you, if you have time or if you are interested and you're wanting to pursue this five-year plan, that's how it starts. Um, it's a, when the bindweed is at full bloom is the best time to till it in because it's really focusing all its energy on that top growth. And so it, it doesn't have as much reserves in the roots. So this grower just planted, I don't know that I need to go through all this, but it's essentially a series of cover cropping, disking, um, come through with the sweet plow to, to take off the regrowth once the bindweed does start growing, and then planting other crops, harvest those, and sweet plow again at the end of the season. Just wanted to put that um, reference up for anybody who's interested in this type of a system. Oh, and before I move on, 
um, if you are looking at rotations and cover cropping, please go back to last week's presentation from the Creeps Top team. Um, it was really great and they found some promising solutions with regards to cover cropping and rotations. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the main questions that was asked at last week's webinar was about um, the weed mat and if we could physically or, or any type of, of cultural control using, you know, um, mulches or tarps or anything to smother it out. I'm not an expert per se, but I would, these are from um, our blueberry experiments when they take down the weed mat to do the maintenance on the bushes, there's that bindweed just growing right along there. So, so this is going on underneath of the weed mat and it's really viable, it's still growing. Um, it's, it's definitely a concern. So I didn't get a chance to answer that question last week. So I just wanted to show these few pictures that yes, it is definitely growing and will continue to grow. So that, that's important as Marcelo said, when you're treating this, that you're really trying to get um, to, the, to the base and that those shoots are just, they're just gonna keep on growing underneath, unfortunately. We'll get to some good news here, I promise. One of the important parts about bindweed is that it has these biotypes. Um, this is not my work. It's just a, a paper out of Purdue from the early 90s where they took actual, they, they isolated and found different biotypes. And I know if, you, if you've been struggling with bindweed or even just observing it casually, you'd probably notice that there's different leaf shapes. Um, so this, these people did a study and they found nine distinct biotypes of bindweed. And these types are self-incompatible. So they're not um, crossing with each other. If they do, they're not able to reproduce successfully. Um, and so the leaf shape is the main way to tell them apart. And then of course we have the two flower colors. I've had people mention this to me as well. So yes, there are two distinct flower colors of bindweed, the, the pink hued and the pure white flowers. And if we click here, um, the importance about these biotypes is that there's differences in the vegetative reproduction. So the paper is talking about using tillage as a control method. And if you have biotype one and biotype two, for instance, and you till it under, what you're going to end up with is more of biotype one. So it's just interesting that it can bear, that it outcompetes the other one in, far, um, in response to tillage. And similarly with biotype one versus four, uh, one is thankfully very susceptible to glyphosate. I know that's not an option for many of you, but it's just interesting that 99% that of biotype one can be um, controlled by that, but only 30% of biotype four. So the important thing to note here is that there's this adaptive ability of the weed. It's pretty impressive if you think of it from an ecological standpoint, um, but from a management point, just knowing what you have is a good idea. So <clears throat> my role in this project was to evaluate the biological control options that we have. Um, just as an overview, that, that can mean anything. It's not necessarily insects. I'm an entomologist, so that's what I'm talking about today. But there's other you know, um, pathogens and other things that we can use against weeds. And it all starts by going to the weeds host, native host range and investigating what is feeding on it there. You know, what is going on? What is keeping it managed at the, at the, um, in the native range? So then they bring these hosts back and they're rigorously tested. Um, USDA APHIS, IOBC is the international organization biological control. They do all these testings. Um, they make sure that any agent that they're looking at is host specific. So there's, you know, I always get the question of, oh, is this going to transfer? And yes, there are cases of that, but it's very rare and few and far between. So eventually most, um, many of the agents that they're looking at do go on for approval and it's only then that they're released. So I have down there that it, Biocontrol silver bullet? No, it's not a silver bullet. Um, what we're looking at it here in this case is an integrated tactic. And we've been really successful here in Oregon. If you wanna learn more, there's a little web link there. Um, agents have been released on, there's over 120 agents that have been released on 70 weeds. And we have some great successes here, some great success stories. Um, we're hoping that, that tight end them can be one of those, but not quite yet. Specifically to, for field bindweed, there are two agents that have been approved for release. Um, there's been, these are the, the 
maps of documented establishment. So it's not very encouraging, but <laughs> it's also because we, a lot of people haven't looked at this in their area or that there's no, they're not communicating with this particular system that maps these out. So the top one here is called the bindweed mite. It's a Saria malherbe. It's an areophyid. So the, the S, this is actually a scanning electron microscope photo here. And this is at 250 times, 250 magnification. I used my little handheld lab microscope to try to get this. Um, so you can barely see them, but, but I'll show you a little bit more of what that damage and, and what that looks like in the next slide. And the other one that we have for approved use in the United States is Tidaloctuosa. It doesn't have the official common name of field bindweed moth, but I'm working on that as well. So we'll look first at the mite. I'm, um, just to orient you with this, it, it is an effective biocontrol, especially in arid and semi-arid regions. So if this pertains to you, I would encourage you to um, seek it out and maybe just go out and see if you have it already. Both of these are, both of these agents might be in your fields already. And what you're looking for with the mite, uh, we quantify it by looking at the plant symptomology. So that the tips turn red, um, the, eventually the mid veins will turn red. And this is all because the cells are literally being ruptured by this areophyid mite. It's forming galls. And so that um, is rupturing the cells, and this is how we evaluate the damage. And then eventually, it ends up looking like this curled and twisted um, crystal-covered broccoli. And this is the good stuff. This is what can be redistributed in your fields. Um, actually, mowing is a really great way to just move it along. And then if we, um, you can also take little infested strands and move them physically down the, the field. So next slide, we have... Um, we did a little bit of work with this and wanted to know if the mite could be used in irrigated systems. And so this was a big trial I did at the research farm. Um, it's where we were looking at overhead irrigation, low drip irrigation, and high drip. So just how much water we're providing to the crop to see if the mite would be a viable option for cropping systems. Unfortunately, the short term um, answer <laughs> is that not really every time we give the bindweed um, enough water, the mite is not effective and it actually increases root growth. So sad to say, but it is um, probably just a solution for pastures, rangeland, other places where there's not going to be irrigation. And I encourage you though, if you're interested in that or if you're looking at a naturalized area or anything else, this is the best paper on the mite, on the bindweed mite that I found. It's from New Mexico State. Um, and I can send the link out in the chat after if anybody is interested. So since then, we've moved our efforts onto the moth, Tidaloctuosa. And this is, although there's a lot known about the bindweed mite, there's very little known about the moth. So we kind of had to start with scratch, from scratch here, and it's been a really exciting project for me. Um, this is a, a noctuid moth, actually, and so we're just, it looks like a cutworm, but it's not. I can, we have to remember that all of these are tested and host-specific. It's only feeding on the bindweed. So, Unfortunately, once we let it go off my fingertip there, they're very cryptic. So that's about the last we see of them. And other people that have worked on this agent in Kansas and elsewhere have found the same thing, that they'll go out and do you know, visual scans and, and can't find it ever again. However, um, it, it is very effective at eating bindweed. This is a greenhouse trial in the middle where they strip it all off completely. That would be great if we could show that in the field. Um, and then this is an example in the bottom of what the herbivory looks like. There's a lot of different insects that um, feed on bindweed. So one of the first things we had to do is sort out what the herbivory actually looks like. And we've found that it feeds from the leaf and leaf edge inward. That's an important part. And that it also, if um, you can get that far, we'll clip the petiole right at the base there. So in our grant title, we talked about the veracity of Tidaloctuosa. Um, and that's not just just wordplay, we really are able to show, at least in the lab environment, that they are quite hungry caterpillars. I can throw that in there for my son. Um, but we're looking here, this is a consumption trial that I did in the lab, uh, was starting with 10 grams of, of bindweed on the, on the y-axis and then days. And so this is actually not a typo, this is individual larvae, larva it, per cup, where we're feeding them the bindweed and seeing how much they eat. 
the slopes around there, the equation, so just knowing that um, for large larvae, L4, the triangle at the bottom, the slope is steeper than it is for the other smaller larvae, which is not uncommon. Um, but if we extrapolate this, so this is taking 10 grams of bindweed and reducing it by 64% in eight days. So I just thought, okay, if we extrapolate and start with 100 grams, that's about the size of a medium tomato. Um, you know, imagine 64% of that being gone in a week. That'd be great. Um, <clears throat> because Tida is, is um, there's not a lot of work on this. This isn't an insect you can go and buy from an insectary or, or just, um, you know, have access to. One of our main objectives was to be able to establish a lab colony of it. We, we needed a skilled and patient technician, and thankfully I was able to find one. This is Wyatt. Um, his story, his full story of how he went about this project is at the, our, the organic page, which is what that short link leads to. And he was just really great at this. He was really um, adept at taking care of the, of the moths. Uh, because it's a biocontrol agent, we can't just rear them on diet. We have to actually make them fresh bouquets every few days, um, transfer them carefully from, and so it takes a lot of time. It's not for everybody, <laughs> but I will, um, I am happy to report that we've had success with this. So now we have the protocol established. We were able to get to an F6 generation and, and I'm just really happy and grateful because we need a large amount of larvae if we're gonna be making our field releases and doing these trials in a crop production system. So here's a few pictures of our on-farm releases. We were working in uh, blueberries, mostly. We did work of um, a few other diversified crops. But here's the weed mat, as Marcella mentioned. It's, it's growing right up along there, also in between it with the bushes, um, strangling, twining. It's just a mess. One of the methodologies we were looking at is if we could bag up the larvae. Uh, we did this in the second year to see if there would be an, a difference if we could kind of protect them or, or limit their, their um, movement at the beginning. So those are the example of the mesh bags that we used and then the quadrat that we were sampling in. And this is just an example. This isn't my full um, report, but this is just an example of the type of of parameters that we were looking at. So we have these quadrats, we're looking at, at shoot length, um, flowering within that sample zone, percent cover, and then those evidence of herbivory, those chewing symptoms that we saw. Um, and the what we have here are just different sampling dates. Ideally, I would have more, more points than I do for some of my other sites, but it starts at about 30 days after the release of the larvae. We're going out, we're releasing 10 larvae per plot, and measuring what happens to a few of these things. So this is exploratory. You know, we don't know what we're looking for yet. Um, so these were just the things that we started monitoring at these on-farm releases. And uh, the top two are unfortunate because it even even the percent cover. You're seeing that the bold line is where we have released the larvae, and it's actually 30 days in higher than the unreleased. So that's not great, admittedly. Um, we're, we don't want to see more bindweed than when we started, for sure. But at the end of the experiment, um, it's that it evens out. And in the case of the flowering, it's actually reduced in the plots that received the larvae versus those that didn't. Another example from two other field sites that we have, these are, this is just measuring the shoot length. So just that above ground growth. And unfortunately, I didn't um, have biomass because it's, I can't do destructive sampling, right? So we're just, we're just trying to measure what's there and what happens to it over time. Um, I really thought that, that stem length would be affected. It definitely doesn't seem to be the biggest, the biggest evaluator of, of activity. But at the, on the top graph here, this is at, our, at one of our field sites. Both of these are commercial blueberries. Um, we're just releasing the larvae and we're trying to decide how many is another component of this research. So the 1x and 2x is, refers to 5 or 10 per plot. Um, and it seems that if we put too many that there's this compensatory growth right up, there, can see my, right up here. So if we put 10 larvae out at the end of the experiment, it actually has longer shoots and I, that is statistically significant. So that's um, 
not great. I think the, the weed is responding to the herbivory by shifting those energy resources and, and actually putting more into its shoot growth. Um, down here, we can, you know, if I were to zoom in and I were to get show you the stats on this, this is possibly important where we have five larvae. It's a little bit lower than the check and the, and the 2x rate, but not as much as I hope to see. What we're looking at um, also is how to, how to modify the behavior of this agent. So this is a moth. This is a picture of it that even in this mess of weeds, it has still found the bindweed. It, it knows where it's going and what it's gonna do and it's gonna lay eggs when it gets there. So we're trying to elucidate how that happens and what are the, what are the factors that are involved in that. Um, weeds and plants of any kind are, are releasing all kinds of signals. So there's, there's um, cuticular waxes even on the leaf that can smell good to the agent. There's the floral scent, of course, root exudates can be important. So just trying to first off identify what some of these might be and then figure out how we could use them to our advantage. Um, from a management perspective, we wanted, you know, bindweed is everywhere, but how can we make these insects come and feed on it where we want it gone? <laughs> is a simple way to put it. So I just wanted to mention um, this will be, there's more on this coming. This is part of my dissertation now. So I'm really excited to keep working on this and that all the products that we're looking at so far are approved for organic use. Uh, there's a big difference that, go ahead, it's, you can see there. Um, we just wanna make sure that we are also quantifying the response of males versus females because females are the ones that are gonna be laying eggs. Those eggs turn into hungry little caterpillars. So we're trying to determine the difference between the two and really increase their activity of the females. Um, this is another lab trial and it's really just saying that if we damage the bindweed, this um, COAR is bindweed by itself, um, after it has been chewed on by Tidalectuosa, and then we did a mechanical damage as a control, just because plants send out signals, even if they're just artificially um, damaged, if the leaf tissue is damaged artificially. So, so there is something going on here. You know, we do have some compounds that only show up when it when the bindweed has been exposed to the to the moth larvae. This forms the basis for. My attractant trial that I'm doing, um, I have a great farm manager who was willing to give me this much space and just let the bindweed grow wild. Uh, this is a really great way to evaluate this because it's controlled. We can define plots, we can um, impose treatments and nobody's gonna bother it. So this is really a great, um, although it's not on farm and helpful for those people yet, this is a really good way that we're looking at this, this concept. So I'm taking some of those attractants that we have in mind um, these are sticky traps. Yes, some, those are the beneficial moth on the traps. But once we once we look at this and figure out, then we deploy it in the field and see what we can see. So these are um, just a, an example of what happens when we add the larvae only. This is difference in cover from the beginning of the experiment to the end of the experiment. Larvae only, this is the one without pheromone. Pheromone only without larvae and then both. So there's a little bit of um, increase. Of course, these confidence intervals are, are, you know, of course, very wide, very, very, um, oh, not, not able to be clear that we have a clear pattern yet, but I think it's worthwhile. Um, it's worth exploring because the, the pheromone alone does seem to reduce the growth. Um, this is 30%, that would, that's like a great, a good benchmark. And then when we put both out there in the field, we are seeing a reduction of the bindweed. So more to come on this later, but I just wanted to show you um, kind of the process that we're, that we're going through with these experiments. Integrated weed management. It's been a, a concept since, be, you know, way before my time even. This book was written in 1977. But I just wanted to reiterate that we're, when we're looking and we're dealing with a difficult weed like field bindweed, we have to take a truly integrated approach. Many little hammers, as um, Liebman and Gallant have said, it's a great paper if you haven't read it, where we really have to come at it from all different angles. And biocontrol is just one of those tools in that toolbox. So we're looking at it, we're doing research, um, working with other people that are working on bindweed and seeing if they're interested in integrating biocontrol. And then just knowing 
all that we can know about these two agents. This is all we have to work with. There are a few other uh, possibilities coming down the pipeline, but they're not here yet. So um, just learning everything we can about the agents, I think is really valuable. And as far as integrating it into current systems, it's going to be all about the timing. Um, these both agents have their own unique life cycles. And when we think about integrating that into a production setting, we have to think about not necessarily the herbicides, but the insecticides. I'll show you in the next slide here. And then of course, if it's compatible with the mechanical things that Martello and others are doing. These are a few Omri insecticides for blueberries specifically. And you know, you're using your, if you're growing blueberries, you're spraying these things um, to get rid of these terrible pests. And what we don't know is if it's affecting that non-target organism, so the Tida. You know, it, it is a lepidopteran, so this BT is, is probably harmful to it. And we don't know about all these other things. So this is definitely something I'll be looking into. It wasn't a specific objective of our grant here, but it's it's important to know. Um, you know, we're this is just a visual of like, you know, the bindweed is growing down here. The the pest problems are occurring up in the bush, but is that enough distance? Or is there a way that we could um if these are harmful to Tida, is there a way that we could separate that or, and that's where we get back to the pushing and pulling concept of, of maybe we could, you know, remove the moths from the field when those sprays are happening and bring them back in when we're done with the um, applying treatments. So I did say it's about the timing and this is one of the, one of the good things that's come out of this work is that we've evaluated for three years plus um, the flight timing of the adult moth. <clears throat> so this is reported in its native range that it is bivolting. It has two activity peaks. And you can see that briefly with these, these peaks. This is plotted against degree days. And this is just done using those sticky traps and evaluating moths per day. Um, this is done in an area where I know the population is. It's clearly and firmly established there. So it's a good place to evaluate the the activity of the moth. This is the adult moth that we're looking at. And so when the adult moth comes out in the spring, it's it's synchronized with the weed, you know, so we're seeing activity here. And then I'll talk about this point in the middle and then a reemergence, or we're not sure if it's an actual second generation or if it's just a bivoltine activity peak or flight of the adults. But if we can avoid, <laughs> um, insecticides specifically in this time period, we might give the moth a better chance. And you know, you could use those mechanical or, or chemical controls on the bindweed in the spring and in the fall. Um, and that's a, those are both great times to try to control bindweed. We've seen that in lots of other literature. So, so this isn't an answer, but it's just part of what we're considering of how to integrate biocontrol into a system. I just wanted to say that I'm grateful for working um, in the organic, working on this grant and being funded. You know, I think it's a really good fit for growers who have very limited options. Everything that we're using is, is non-synthetic. Um, uh, Tida is considered a beneficial insect. You know, it's, it is doing its job feeding on that weed. It's also a pollinator in general. So it's, you know, it's got to get its energy from other flowers, just like any other moth. So there's no harm in the, and having the adults around for sure, and that it's just a really good fit. Um, in terms of what you can do or how to help the moth along, we've established now that they are here in Western Oregon, they can overwinter. Um, so, you know, really just having an establishment habitat, this is, if you have a place where you have bindweed and you don't necessarily need to control it, that would be great for any moths that may be in the area. If you're interested, I can help you, you know, test that and see if you have bindweed moths before we go about augmenting more. Um, and then, like I mentioned, they're just generalist pollinators. Any habitat for other pollinators is going to be good for them. And then this is an example of, of bindweed on the edge. You know, maybe you don't need to control this, but you definitely don't want this moving into your field. So, so maybe we can make a release here and hopefully um, through the, our work that we're still doing and still conducting, we can get that activity into the cropping system. Thank you so much. I usually have bindweed on the brain, on my brain, so I'm happy to take um, any questions and follow up with you after the webinar here. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jessica and Marcelo. Um, we're going to move on to our Q&A section now. Um, we had one question about suppress and why it wasn't evaluated for new shoot growth. So um, Marcelo, you might want to take that one. So suppress wasn't as effective when we tried uh, on the effic efficacy part. So we decided to drop it and focus on the other two. Okay, and um, this one would be for either of you. Um, what is a sweet plow that was um, mentioned by Jessica in that five year plan for um, bindweed control? Sure, um, it's my understanding. I mean, I'm, I'm not great at my implements, but it's my understanding that it's it's like the chisel plow, but it's cutting a little bit deeper that it's actually cutting um, as it goes through. It's got those little feet on it. Okay, um, are all the different um, bindweed biotypes here in Oregon? That's a great question. Um, I don't know that anybody has looked at it since those the people out of Purdue. Um, I know people notice it, but I don't know that it's ever been quantified. I haven't done a, a study on that, um, but I've seen just, you know, um, in trials and around the valley, I definitely have seen a few of them. I wouldn't say that all nine are here, but I would estimate maybe four four or five of those different leaf shapes I've seen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, would a seria, the mite you were talking about, be appropriate for dry farmed crops in Western Oregon, do you think? I do. I think that'd be a great fit for, for it. Um, and the other benefit about those mites is that those are more readily available. So we have a great biocontrol program at our at ODA, our Oregon Department of Agriculture. Um, I didn't, as far as I know, those are still being distributed. You can get in contact with that person. Um, I can send his info here and and get some. They come in a little paper lunch sack and put it out in a dry farmed area. I think that's a great use for him. Absolutely. Great. Um, what's the spectrum of efficacy for the moths? Do they work across the different bindweed biotypes or um, also on other closely related weed species? Sure, great question. Um, they do work on the biotypes. Fortunately, they're, you know, the biotypes aren't that different. They are still the same species. So, so yes, they are going to be able to equally and evenly feed on all of those. Um, and it, but they cannot, there's, one of the publications um, that has been done on the on the host preference, they do feed on hedge bindweed, and that that was a concern for some because some of the some areas, California, looking at you, um, consider that a protected species. You know, where every others consider it a weed, so they feed on it. But interestingly, they cannot complete development on that, so they only go through their full life cycle on field bindweed. Um, let's see, do the moth larvae or adults have any issues with the levels of moisture or humidity the way the mites do? Not that I know of. Um, we've, you know, we've looked at it in irrigated systems for a few years now. Um, they seem to be fine. We didn't have to, to adjust the humidity at all in our rearing protocol. Um, just, no, they're pretty, pretty solid and easy to work with. Um, and I don't, I can't think of any other reason why they would be affected by, by moisture or humidity. Okay, great. Good question. Yeah. Um, here's another one. Um, did birds eat the biocontrol caterpillars? Uh, that is a good one as well. Yes, yes, they are um, prone to that, of course. Yeah, but one of the good things um, is that they're they're so cryptic you know they're going to be down on the ground in that mass of bindweed but yes um birds there's also pre um, predatory insects that could get at them there's one paper published about the pre predator guild for tida and it mentions fire ants so thankfully we don't have those to deal with but but it is um a possibility yep and that's one of the things we're trying to to isolate out too by by putting out um Tida, and that's what we were going with, with trying to protect them in those mesh bags, just to see if that would make any difference. But it just didn't, that's not the way to, to investigate that. We'll have to keep looking. But yes, um, birds, anything else are going to eat them if they can find them. 
Okay, great. And here's kind of a related question. Um, were any of the blueberries netted against birds and would bird netting hinder the adult moss ability to access the bindweed and lay eggs? Oh, that's a great question. Um, we did not look at netted fields in our, in our trial, um, but I don't think so. Um, I, I think that those two systems would be compatible. I, um, yeah, that's a really good idea. Good, good idea to look at that. Yeah, I guess it would depend how big, you know, whether they the can get through is, the sure. netting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you know, okay, so this would probably be a good question for the presenters of last week's webinar because um, they um, talk more about cover crops. And so I would encourage anybody who's interested in that to listen to the recording of last week's webinar. You can just Google webinars by eOrganic and you can find our archives or Google eOrganic YouTube channel and it's on there too. But um, this one is, what do you know about using cucurbits to suppress bindweed? Has anyone looked into that? I can comment on that. Okay. We we did not look into that. It was wasn't part, but looking at blueberry fields, they I would say always have a uh, perennial cover crop, usually a grass between the rows. And despite of that, we still see bindweed growing there. And those are some sort of chewing fescue uh, that that should be fairly competitive with most weeds. So so bindweed is is, is a difficult one. I think you could make some difference, but in that system, we already have a cover crop or the mochas and it's still thriving so i i have read um one paper and if I, i'll connect with you alice to see who is asking this question because i think i could put my hands on it but I, I have seen something about pumpkins being um having almost an allelopathic effect hmm. they have to be um tilled in i believe was my understanding it was like they have to actually be incorporated into the soil but yes, it's a, it's another one of those obscure, um, you know, urban myths about how to kill bindweed, and I have seen something about that. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just looking to see if we have any more questions. Oh yeah, here's one. Um, can you explain the five by five factorial again, please? It's basically, a combination of the five treatments, which is non-treated, steam, brush weeder, and the two herbicides all possible combinations. So I have non-treated followed by one of those five, and then you do the same thing for the other five treatments. So you end up with effectively effectively 25 treatments. This is, so the plots were fairly large. They were like 80 foot long. At the end of the day, we had almost three acres on each time we ran the, that study. Uh, and that's why I simplified to the main factors of the second application. So you were just looking at, five columns over two seasons. Um, let's see, someone had asked earlier um, if Marcelo could say again how much time was needed with the steam. Um, I think maybe that was when the video was running, so maybe she didn't hear. So the steamer is a mobile unit, so you hook up to the tractor, and we learned that driving a half a mile an hour would generate enough steam to, to suppress most of the weeds. I, I didn't show that data, I just uh, comment on it. So you, you don't spend, unlike some other systems where you're steaming the soil and then you basically heat up the soil temperature for like over two hours or so. In this case, I have a moving unit. So a half a mile an hour, you could do some math on, on, on how long it takes to cover uh, one square foot it would be something like three seconds or so. So it's a moving unit. Okay, yeah, here's another comment again about the use of cucurbits to suppress bindweed. Um, here, um, the person who had asked the question said that they tried it and they've seen good results, but they were not able to get rid of bindweed. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, I think we have one more question here, which had to do with the difference between suppress and hand weeding, because he had noticed that the graph with suppress showed no difference between that and the hand weeding. I was trying to unmute myself here. So oh. the hand weeding, I think the time I showed suppress data, it was basically non-treated and suppress, and there was no difference. And, but I don't want to move my presentation here to go back to the to the slide. Okay, yeah, everybody should have received a handout too. And um, 
we'll be sending you that again when we send you the um, evaluation survey. Um, we have a couple more questions coming in. Can you talk more, uh, Marcelo, about the damage that the brush weeder made on the weed mat? Did you see rips on the weed mat? So if the weed mat was basically new with no damages, we just saw what I call a wear out. It would change color as you, 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 as you were abrasing it. If there is any damage, pre-existing damage, then would rip out. And that's assuming you have constant movement. There were a time that we stop in between plots and that would go through the weed mat in a split second. So you cannot stop as you're working on it. That, that's kind of why I don't think it's a perfect fit for the weed mat. And then we try to, 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 to basically apply that spinning brush at different angles to minimize how much of it would be touching the plastic. But the challenge with that is that you don't get the weeds there going over the plastic into the into the, the crop, which is the bindweed, which is our major target. Okay, yeah. Um, let's see. Do we know what the bindweed seeds thermo tolerance is? I don't um, have the figure, but I do know that they are not effectively destroyed by by um, casual composting. That has to be, you know, they're that's why they're still able to persist in that compost. Um, I don't know, maybe Linda Brewer, the compost expert, she's on our grant. She might be able to look into that for you. Um, but it's pretty high. It, it's it's easily, and that's why they can be moved around fields and persist in the soil. So yes, we can get back to you with that. Okay, um, if anybody has any more questions, I'm just gonna give another minute here. Um, well, and, I have a um, comment about oh, sure. this last question. Mm -hmm. So this, I assume this uh, is relates back to this team. So the way we are applying this team, because it's a mobile unit, we are not heating up the soil uh, to the point that would make a difference in any seeds. So there's no, uh, long-term effect on seed banks and, and and bindweed have really tough seeds they're mostly dormant they would come into germination later on so i suspect whatever number it is will be pretty high compared to other okay um oh here's the last comment um that someone noticed that goats love bindweed have you tried anything with goats so in, in high value crops the problem with goats is that they like eating a lot of things, not just bindweed. <laughs> they like climbing on things and they would severely damage, uh, I, I suppose, irrigation system, plastic mulch, plants and everything. So not quite compatible with the system I was working on. And if I were to try, I would try sheep over goats anytime. <laughs> okay. All right, I think we're out of questions here. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for asking these questions. So thank you, Marcelo and Jessica for this great presentation. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. And I look forward to hearing more about the electric weeding project.